Back in 2013, there was a song entitled Overcomer. And that particular song was released, and we know that it eventually won a Grammy. A woman by the name of Mandisa just belted out the song. She did a fantastic job of, of expressing not just the lyrics of the song and her musicality, but also of her passion to get the message across. And this music video, what it does basically is it, it features various celebrities and they each have their inspirational stories of, of how they were able to overcome. And throughout the music, you cannot help but feel like you are watching individuals who are, are going through a fight, some kind of a battle. These include a figure skater, Scott Hamilton, as well as a congresswoman, uh, Gabby Giffords, and news anchor, Robin Roberts. And the song really is about overcoming uh, our, our discouragements, our, our difficulties, the, the challenges that we're facing in life, and, and also having hope in God. Our praise team sang this song at the conclusion of our service last Sunday. They did a beautiful job. What an inspiration that song is, don't you think? There is a, a great feeling and there's a, a, a sense of victory that we can experience in our lives when we know there's an obstacle in our way, but we're able to override it instead of it override us. I tell you, it is one thing to be in a circumstance it's a completely different thing to be under that circumstance. But the best thing of all is to be on top of that circumstance. And that's what overcoming enables us to do. And so my question to you this morning right now is, are you an overcomer? As you think about your life, would you say that is true of you? It could be that, that you are an overcomer, and if that's the case, there's, there's something that you have been able to overcome. It could be some kind of a challenge. It might be some type of difficulty or perhaps a, a, a trial in your life and, and it's just been weighing you down and, and you know what that area is. And so are you an overcomer today? The Greek word for overcomer is nakao and it means to prevail or to win one's cause or to be victorious in different and difficult circumstances. It deals with being victorious over or in, or in the midst of some circumstances that are illegitimately holding you hostage. If you are being held hostage right now, at this very moment, by something that is overcoming you, something that has been overtaking you, then you need to become an overcomer. That is something that is critically important at this point in your life. You need to learn what it means to be able to prevail, to be victorious over that situation in your life. Now, maybe you're thinking to yourself, Jeff, I, I'm, I'm just tired. I'm, I'm tired of losing. I'm, I'm putting up the fight. And I'm constantly being knocked down to the mat. And I'm just, I'm struggling. And I, I don't want to, to be overcome anymore. How can I overcome and not be overcome? Well, fortunately, we find some answers in the book of Revelation. And you've got to see this for yourself. And so I invite you to open your Bible right now to Revelation chapter 12. The 12th chapter of the book of Revelation has as its setting the future. Something that has not yet taken place. It'll be a scary time for the entire world. You think times are hard now? You think we're going through rough, rough waters during this time? Well, what's going on in this day and age can't even compare to what's coming. 
It will be hell on earth. It will be the absolute worst period of time of all human history of what's coming. It is a time period known as the tribulation. At this point in time, yet in the future, we are aware of the fact that Satan will be cast down from heaven uh, to the earth. We know from reading the book of Job that Satan has access to communicating with God. But at the time that is recorded in Revelation chapter 12, he will be thrust down, he'll be thrown down to the earth. And that Satan is going to persecute the Jews as well as Jewish believers in Jesus. Revelation chapter 12, verse 17 makes that abundantly clear, especially in the context of Revelation chapter 12. Why is that? The reason for it is this, very simply. Satan is, without question... The, the, the greatest anti-Semitic being in existence. When you think of people who are anti-Semitic, whether it be Hamas, or whether it be Hitler, or Haman, or others in history, um, even all wrapped up into one, the ultimate anti-Semitic being in the universe is Satan. And so he's going to go on a rampage to be able to get after the Jewish people and Jewish believers in Jesus. Again, Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And then we are told that he's going to empower the Antichrist, according to Revelation chapter 13, verse 2. And he will persecute the rest of Jesus' followers at that time. Now, even though Revelation chapter 12 takes place in the future, I want you to be aware of the fact that there are lessons in that chapter that directly apply to us today. It is relevant in our times, in the here and now. Let me remind you of the scripture that we earlier read together. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished into all good works. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And because the book of Revelation is a part of scripture, it is profitable. In fact, the beginning of Revelation tells you that you're blessed if you read this book. And so we are going to discover some important, relevant information that you could immediately use, even though in the context it is telling us with prophetically what's going to unfold in the future during the time of tribulation. Notice, if you will, the first three words that we come across here in Revelation 12 and verse 11. It says, and they, what? They overcame. Now there's our word. It identifies how tribulation saints will be victorious. It identifies how tribulation saints will prevail. It identifies how tribulation saints will overcome. Now keep in mind that, that God does not place overcoming in your hand. He places it within reach. It is something that is accessible to you. But God doesn't just dump it on your lap. That's not the way he rolls. There's a big difference. God places victory within your reach, not within your hand. And the reason for that is because he wants you to exercise faith. And so this is not a passive experience where you're just kind of sitting there on your own, digging your own chili, and, and all of a sudden, one day, one day you're going to become an overcomer. That you're going to be able to overcome. No, there's, there's no passivity that we discover in this phrase. This is something that you bring to the mix. This is something on your part that you assertively need to put forth if you, in fact, are going to become an overcomer. Overcoming is something that you need to carry out. 
You don't just passively sit back and hope that you will be among those who are able to overcome. You might recall from Romans chapter 12, verse 21, it says, Do not be overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. That's something that you need to do. And as a body of believers, we are, we are with our, our chief executive commander and the armies of heaven. And he wants to mobilize us as a part of the body of Christ to not sheepishly sit back and take it on the chin. He wants us to bring it to the enemy. He wants us to fight the good fight. He wants us to be in the battle, to be proactive, to take the initiative, and to pull out the stops and fight the enemy. And we are going to discover that it is this ultimate anti-Semitic being himself that we're fighting against. We're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against the, the principalities, the powers, the world forces of this darkness, the rulers. There is a spiritual fight that is going on in the invisible realm that we don't see, but we are a part of that fight. We're not just allowing the demons and the angels uh, to, to take each other on and, and duke it out. No, we are a part of this celestial battle that God has enlisted us to be a part of. Now notice again, chapter 12, verse 11, the next word says, who these tribulation saints will overcome. It says they overcame him. Who's him? Well, verse 9 tells us exactly who him is. It is Satan. So the question before us is, how will these tribulation saints be able to overcome Satan? How will they be able to prevail against him? How will those who are living during the time of the tribulation be able to overcome and be victorious over the ultimate enemy of all of humanity? Well, if we could know how they will overcome Satan in the future, then we can know for ourselves how we in this day and age can also overcome the enemy. Notice how it says they overcame him because of the blood of the Lamb and because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. Now, the way that they will be able to prevail, the way they are going to be able to be victorious and overcome is by putting into practice three things. And whenever Satan is after you personally, you right now, in the here and now, can put into practice these three weapons that God wants you to not only be aware of, but access and utilize in your spiritual battle against him. Let's look at that first um, tool that he gives to us. We could summarize all these tools by saying that uh, they, that is the tribulation saints, will be able to overcome because of the cross, because of their confession, and because of their commitment. So let's look at that first way that tribulation saints will be able to overcome the enemy, and it's by understanding the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ is just as relevant today as it was 2,000 years ago. There are many people who, around the world, um, will say that they, they hold to the historic fact that, that Jesus died on the cross for their sins. They will tell you, yes, I believe that, that Jesus died for me. He shed his blood on my behalf. I am saved. I'm... I have received Jesus as my Savior and Lord. And all of that is true. All of that is acceptable. They will, in fact, go to heaven. But the people in Revelation chapter 12 here are not just trusting in Jesus' blood that was shed for them 2,000 years ago, approximately. No, they are overcoming by the blood of Jesus in the present this is important that we get this. 
We don't just nod our head and give a big thumbs up to Jesus and salute him for what he did in the past. We are clinging to the work of Christ in the here and now. It makes a powerful difference in our lives when we are thinking about doing supreme ultimate battle against the enemy. Listen, Hamas is not the ultimate enemy. Hezbollah is not the ultimate enemy. Iran, Russia, China are not the ultimate enemy. Satan is. Satan may work through various human pawns to accomplish his goal, but uh, Lucifer, the devil, is the ultimate supreme enemy of this world of individuals and of you. And so all believers need to be equipped in understanding how we can not only effectively carry out war against the enemy, but how we can overcome the enemy. And that's what we all desire and we all need. Uh, we don't want to just benefit in eternity by holding on to the work of Christ in the past. We want to benefit in the present. So the question before us is, how can we make the blood of Jesus relevant now, today, at this very moment? Well, again, the answer is implied in Revelation 12, verse 10. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10, brings to our attention that Satan is involved in constantly accusing the brethren. And it'd be easy for us to want to just blow off those accusations and say to ourselves, you know, he's a slanderer, he's a liar. You know, in all honesty, I'm sure a lot of those accusations are accurate. I am sure that many of the accusations that the enemy levels against you and me are true. They're legitimate. And he would be within his right to communicate those charges. But the blood of the lamb silences. It puts a zipper on the mouth of our enemy. And that's because when Jesus died on the cross... Not only was he victorious over sin and hell, but he was victorious over Satan. He defeated Satan himself. That's why, even though Satan may accuse you before the throne, he ultimately is the loser because Christ said, I win, you lose. What I did at the cross uh, there on Golgotha paid the price. And my children are covered in the blood of the Lamb. They are forgiven. Through the blood of Christ, the devil's power was broken. And because when Jesus was victorious over Satan, when we exercise faith in Jesus, Jesus' victorious standing over Satan is applied to us personally. It's our standing. Jesus' victory over the enemy becomes our victory over the enemy. Look, we need to man up, woman up. We need to stop being intimidated. We don't need to be intimidated by Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, by uh, terrorism. Because we have the ultimate supreme victor on our side. We are on the side of the champion, heaven's champion, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. We need to understand this. So whenever Satan accuses you, whenever he's trying to, to muddy your reputation and destroy you, you can simply point to the work of Christ on the cross and therein rest in Jesus' finished work on your behalf. So again, no matter what the accusations are, no matter how many of these accusations are brought before the throne, you can overcome the enemy by pointing to what the Messiah has carried out on our behalf. Jesus' blood meets and defeats every charge that has been leveled against you. And so how can we overcome Satan, the ultimate, strong, created being perhaps the strongest, most powerful created being, we can do it not in our own strength, in our own power, but through our leaning upon the work and person of Jesus in the here and now. Not just thanking God for forgiveness of our sins in the past, 
present and future, but the power that the blood of the Lamb has to overcome any satanic attack in our lives. Let's quickly look at that second weaponry, that second tool that we need to have if we are going to overcome the enemy, and that is confession. Confession, that's what the future tribulation saints will use to overcome Satan. Now stay with me. Watch this. You will not overcome whatever you need to overcome if you are a secret agent Christian. So let's get that straight. If you're an undecided voter, you're not going to be able to overcome the enemy. If you are a spiritual CIA representative, you're not going to be able to overcome the enemy. If you're a covert operative, you're not going to be able to overcome the enemy. If that's true of you, you could forget about overcoming because Jesus is not going to help people overcome if they are too embarrassed to be associated with him. He wants us to take a stand for him. He wants us to be bold for him. He doesn't want us to be shy and sheepish when it comes to not the good news, but the greatest news that there is in all the universe. Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll also confess you before my Father who is in heaven. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. In other words, if you just want this meeting with me with the saints on Sunday, if you just want to have this little private shindig with other believers one day a week in privacy, if it's your heart's desire that, that you don't want other people to know that you are a true follower of Jesus, then in essence he can say back to you, hey, don't be calling on me when you want me to help you overcome. If you're not willing to take a stand with me, then why should I assist you with overcoming when you don't even want to give a sense that you even know me, that there's a relationship with me? Let me say it another way. If you are a camouflage believer and you just want to blend in with society, that is not going to cut it. If you are just going to generally make reference to God in a loosey-goosey way, just just as you're out in the public and, and someone says, uh, how are you doing? Well, well, God is good to me. That's, that's not going to cut it. We need to take a stand distinctively with Jesus as his true followers, as those who know him, who love him, who are not ashamed of him. That is critically important. You say, why do I need to spell out the fact that it's Jesus because every knee shall bow every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father hey everyone's going to confess Jesus either in time or eternity people who are putting off now and they do not want to come to Christ they will be coerced to bow the knee to Jesus at a time in the future in eternity so the Father is glorified when, when Jesus is the superstar. When he is put on display, when we are not embarrassed about him. The text says here, it is by the word of your testimony. And then, did you notice he hits us with a zinger? He hits us with a, a third way that we can overcome. What's the first way? We are clinging to the work of Christ on our behalf, his precious blood that was shed for us to overcome Satan in the here and now. The second weaponry that God gives to us to overcome the enemy is by seeing to it that we utilize confession, that we are open and clear about our devotion to Christ. Let's look at that third and, and final piece of, of, of weaponry that God gives to us. And it's simply when we think about tribulation saints, it tells us in the scripture here that they're able to overcome by their commitment. Now this last, this last area of overcoming, frankly, has a lot of believers intimidated. And it scares a lot of us. And we think to ourselves, I don't know if, 
This is something that even with the help of God I can do. This is really serious stuff here, Pastor. So let's look at what the text tells us. John says, And they did not love their life even when faced with death. They are able to overcome because they possess a love relationship with God that even transcends dying. Now let that sink in for a moment. This is a serious commitment. We know that Hamas, Hezbollah, we know that various terrorist organizations, they are happy to die for their beliefs. It's a culture of death. They celebrate death. They live for death. They will get on the phone and, and call a parent and celebrate how many Jewish people they killed on a given day. They love death. It's a culture of death. And so I'm not saying that, that we should be um, excited to die or try to put ourselves in a position to die, to get killed off. My point here is that tribulation saints will be able to overcome the enemy because they possess a love relationship with the Lord that transcends even death itself. It transcends dying. You say, I, I have a hard time relating. No, you don't. Let me explain how. Many of you are parents, your grandparents. And if you were in a situation where you had no choice but to lay down your life for your son or daughter or children or grandchildren, you would do it. There are our husbands that love their wives and they desire to protect them to the extent that they're just not going to let uh, some person come along and, and have their way with their wife. There are husbands, I included, who would gladly lay down my life for my wife. And other husbands who truly love and are devoted to their mate they would lay down their life for their mate or for their child. And so this is not totally foreign to us. But this takes a commitment. This is serious stuff. We know what it's like to sacrifice life for love. In our passage that says that to be an overcomer, you've got to be willing to die for Christ. Now that will scare off a lot of people. That's not feel-good gospel information that maybe they, they heard just walk the aisle, pray a prayer, and it's all good, call it a day. Just, just pray the sinner's prayer and you're in. No, this is serious stuff. Let's not forget in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, Jesus says, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself and what? Take up his cross and follow me. And by that, he's not saying, hey, put on the, the, the cross on your jewelry. Not that there's anything wrong with having jewelry that has a cross dangling from it. But that is not what the Lord is getting across. He's saying, you need to be willing to die for me. You need to be willing to experience an execution on my behalf. That's what the cross represents. It's a tool of capital punishment that was meted out. We have to be willing to die for the Lord. Or I would say we're not serious about him. I would say that we just are interested in the, the bennies, the, the benefits, the, the, the good times, the, the fellowship, the donuts, and, and call it a day. But a true commitment to Jesus goes to the extent where we tell ourselves, because of what you were willing to do for me, because you died for all of my sins, and you are a great and loving Savior, the least I ought to be willing to do is lay down my life for you. If you were to call me to do that, that is the level of commitment that I'm willing to express back to you, Lord. Now, you don't earn your salvation by being martyred for your faith. Let me clarify that. 
And you're not going to get God to love you anymore because you're willing to die for the Lord. All I'm saying is that just as tribulation saints are able to overcome the enemy with a willingness to lay down their life, the same thing should be true for you and me. That's the point. This is a serious commitment. This is not some kind of casual Christianity here. Uh, this is not people running around just saying, God, bless me. Bless me, God. And, and uh, once in a while come to church and, and smile and shake hands and, and do the religious thing. This is serious Christianity. Uh, we don't just come to church looking for God to, to rain down his blessings and, and do some miracle on our behalf for our benefit. Uh, we don't want to be part-time Christians. When it comes to Jesus, we need to be all in. He wants us not to, to put our, our toe in the, the shallow end of, of the water. He wants us to jump into the deep end, knowing that he will catch us. And, and it's not like there's going to be some kind of a, a raft or, or noodle in some kind of a spiritual pool existence for us. He will catch us. He's, he's got us. We are to have the mindset, just as the Apostle Paul said, Christ in me is to live, to die is gain. Philippians chapter 1, verse 21. We ought to have as a commitment in our spirit, in other words, I would rather die for Jesus, obeying him, than rebelling against the Lord and doing what Satan wants me to do. I'd rather die than obey the enemy. So if being rejected because of Christ, if being misunderstood because of Jesus, if not being liked because of Jesus, if being taken out and boosted into eternity uh, takes place, if dying for Jesus is what unfolds, then so be it. So be it. If that is what the, the Master uh, has for us in his providential care, as he's working in our lives individually, that's the way it is. So there is an understanding, let me come back to this, that the one who is pursuing a relationship with the Lord is a love relationship. And it's a relationship that says, I love you so much that you mean more to me than life itself. Just as a devoted parent would say that about a child or a grandchild. And just as a committed spouse would be willing to do that for his or her mate. We're not looking for death, but we don't fear death either. Jesus says, do not fear those who kill the body but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who's able to destroy both soul and body in hell. And so the one we fear, the one we hold in awe and reverence, are not the enemies of this world, are not the political adversaries, even those who would drag down our country. They are not the ultimate enemy. Satan is. Now let me put all this together. The blood of the Lamb points us back to what Jesus did in the past. The word of our testimony points us back to what Jesus did in the past, and it as also tells us of what is Jesus is doing with us in the present. And yet, not loving our life, even to the point of death, points us to the future, to what Jesus will do for us at a time yet to come. To put it another way, believing in the blood of Jesus gives proof that we have been justified. Uh, expressing a word of testimony for Jesus indicates that we are in the process of being sanctified. And not loving your life, even to the point of death, proves that you have a confidence that one day you will be glorified. Barring the rapture, all of us will die. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. But if we have to die, 
then let us die for the ultimate supreme cause of the universe. Tribulation saints are going to not just be carrying out yeoman duty, putting in the old college effort. They will be bold. They will have a true commitment. And my challenge to each of us this morning is replace fear with faith. Keep your eyes on Jesus, not like Peter, who was watching the storm around him and the rocky waves about his feet. And as a result of that, he went under. Keep your eyes on Jesus. We know how the story ends, don't we? We know who's got our back. We don't have to worry. He's got you. You can be an overcomer. There is a progression in the level of dedication that is required here. I don't know if you noticed that. It's one thing to believe in the blood of the Lamb. It takes more dedication to give a word of testimony for the Lamb, but it takes ultimate dedication to be willing to be martyred for the Lamb. So just as we think about this, how can you overcome the forces of hell itself? Satanic attack? Well, like the believers in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, you can now, today, you can overcome the enemy through your confidence in the substitutionary cross of Christ, through your confession in the transforming power of Christ, and also by your commitment to following the person of Christ. Now, once you have identified yourself with Christ to that extent, at that point, you are an overcomer you will automatically overcome. It, it's the conclusion. It's already been prescripted. I know this might embarrass you, but I'm going to ask you anyway. How many of you enjoy watching professional wrestling from time to time? Probably about two. Oh, we, we have at least uh, a few takers here. Um, let me explain something. It's all fixed. It's, it's, it's fake. It's, it's been prescripted. Uh, they have already prescribed, uh, they've prescripted, predetermined who's going to win. The outcome has already been established. They know who the winner is of that. And I could give you a, a couple of ways to demonstrate that to you. It's not that I watch professional wrestling. I haven't done so in a, a long time. Not that it's sinful if you watch it, but... Uh, I, I've seen enough of it in the past to know that, you know, during a wrestling match, just at a certain particular time, there are other wrestlers who, who come on the scene and they're, they're waiting in the, in the shadows and they're, they're about to, to enter into the ring. See, it's, it's been prescripted. It's been predetermined. Still not convinced? You still think professional wrestling is the real deal? You tell me, how is it possible that you're seeing a guy, he looks like he has been beaten to a pulp. I mean, this guy, it's like, how can he survive such a beating? And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, he gets energized. And it's like he's had 20 zip fizzes or some other type of energy drink. And this guy is all of a sudden, he wakes up and, and he's able to just pound on his enemy and he wins. It's, it's been predetermined. It's been pre-scripted. Listen, I, I know that the, the enemy has been slamming you. I know that your circumstances have been wiping you out. I know that your, your sins have been dragging you down. They, they have been putting the big hurt on you. I know it looks like the, the enemy has your number. I, I'm, I'm aware that through the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus has already prescribed for you to be the winner. You see, it's already prescripted. It's already been prescripted that you will be an overcomer because of what Jesus has done on your behalf. He's already prescripted that Satan no longer has control over you. He's already prescripted that the enemy himself has no control over you. He's already prescripted that your circumstances have no control over you. He's prescripted that greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. How many of you believe this? Most of you, yes. 
And so it is, in essence, God is saying to you, look, I know that you've been thrown down. I know that you've been beaten up. But you can now look at the enemy and declare, look, I am an overcomer. Because of the person and work of Jesus, I stand in him. I am more than a conqueror through Christ. And I'm coming back. And you will be defeated. In fact, you already were defeated. And I just cling to that. I claim that for myself. Let's stand together.